I'd like to begin by introducing our first morning's feature, which is Mark Pavluk, coming from Cambridge. He grew up in Buffalo, and he studied both physics and poetry. And he studied uh, over at MIT with Denise Levertov. He is the author of six poetry compilations, uh, collections of your own writing, is it? And yes and uh, also a number of compilations and anthology he is editor of, one including When We Were Countries, which is poems and stories by, out by outstanding high school writers. <coughs> His own work has been translated into a number of languages and is included in many journals and anthologies, including the best American poetry edit edited by Billy Collins. He is the co-editor of Hangin' Loose Press, uh, Dick Lurie, also an editor for that, who was here last June. And Hangin' Lo Loose Press is one of the oldest independent journal and press in the country, starting in 1966. He has taught poetry and math and science from middle school to college, presently teaching math at University of Massachusetts in Boston and is the director of academic support. He's always working on new poems and different ways of writing them. And uh, to my understanding of an interview, is working on a memoir for Denise Levertov right now. And he admits to being a news junkie. And this interest influences a great deal of his poetry. And in fact, he has a book on news-inspired poems as well. And I'd like to end with this quote before he begins. And, and this is from Worcester Magazine. At a time when many Americans are too demoralized or too confused, as Gore Vidal says, to remember anything past last Tuesday, Pavlok names things accurately, jogs our memory, and sharpens our wit. So I look forward to what Mark has to share with us this morning. Please give a warm welcome to Mark Pavlok. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, crew, for uh, all the good work you're doing and about to do. Um, one, one small correction to what Cheryl said. Uh, the, the magazine I edit, uh, Hanging Loose, which I have a copy of, the current issue, is uh, it's a journal not just for, uh, for young people. Uh, it's actually a journal for adult professional writers, but we include, uh, we have a special section devoted to high school writers. And we've been doing that since uh, the magazine's inception in 1966. One of the more exciting things uh, about that magazine is always to discover these really terrific young writers. Well, I wasn't up quite as late as Cheryl, but I went to a movie later than I should have last night. Uh, so I thought I'd uh, start out because the theater I went to actually had double features, which is sort of something from my my childhood, I don't find theaters offering double features that much anymore these days. So this is a, uh, a kind of found poem called Double Features. Deer Hunter dances with wolves. Bonnie and Clyde, the best years of our lives. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, birth of a nation. The sound of music all quiet on the Western Front. Double indemnity, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Guess who's coming to dinner? <coughs> Frankenstein. Uh, I, I like to do a lot of uh, sort of media related poems, poems drawn from the newspaper and things like that. And I, so I use a lot of quotation in my work. Um, so this, this poem is kind of my uh, Ars Poetica, I guess. It's called Do's and Don'ts. And it, uh, it has, it's full of quotations uh, from a lot of people. So there's quotations from C.S. Lewis, uh, Ezra Pound, uh, Ornette Coleman, jazz musician, uh, Chuck Close, and uh, several others. So it begins with an epigraph. Tony Bennett said it was Frank Sinatra who told him, steal from one person and it's plagiarism. Steal from everybody and it's research. Okay. 
Keep a strict eye on eulogistic and dislogistic adjectives. Lewis, C.S. Advised Tynan, Kenneth. They should diagnose, not merely blame, and distinguish, not merely praise. Almost any noun is better alone than chaperoned. If it is the right noun, and very few can stand two adjectives. Pound to Parker Tyler. Unsettled dream is stronger than unsettled white dream. Precision and economy of language are virtues I recommend when writing poems, but find difficult to put into practice. It's more important, Ornette Coleman once said, to play the correct note feeling than the correct note. Some of the time, to quote Chuck Close, you know you're cooking. The rest of the time, you just do it. Or as the handbook on improvisation for church organ advises, do not be afraid of being wrong, just be afraid of being uninteresting. I think with all these stickies, I would know exactly the, where the, to find the next poem. So as I said, I, I like to use the uh, contemporary culture and the media in a lot of uh, poems that I do. Uh, and this next poem uh, is a list poem. And it's actually dedicated to uh, Dick Lorry. <clears throat> All shook up. Baby, don't do it. Cross over the bridge. Dance with me, earth angel, for what it's worth. Gangster of love, hard-headed woman. I almost lost my mind just walking in the rain. Last night, my heart has a mind of its own, needles and pins over, under, sideways, down, pain in my heart, reconsider baby, shaken all over, talk, 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 um, 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 um. Voo it, voo it. What kind of fool? You're a heartbreaker. You're a heartbreaker. What does it take? Untie me, tired of waiting for you. Saturday night, ride your pony party doll over and over. Next time you see me, Mustang Sally, laugh, laugh, keep walking on, juke. I've been loving you too long. Honky tonk women, greenback dollar, fun, fun, fun. Everything's all right. Down on the corner, Choo choo chaboogie, blue suede shoes, ain't doing too bad. So next uh, Friday is the anniversary, the tenth anniversary. So last week we had the tenth anniversary of uh, September 11th. It'll be the tenth anniversary of the uh, start of the the war in Afghanistan. And uh, shortly after that, I wrote this poem. Uh, I was sitting with my, uh, at the time, 10-year-old son uh, and a friend of his uh, over, over pizza uh, after their soccer game. And uh, his friend said, uh, you want to hear a joke? I said, sure, OK. He said, uh, why aren't there any Walmarts in Afghanistan? Because they're all targets. <laughs> So this was a 10-year-old, so you can see what had already filtered into the uh, consciousness of children. Uh, so this, uh, this is largely a found poem taken from an editorial in the New York Times. All the news, September 23rd, 2001. According to the Times, quote, Air Force bombers are heading toward distant airfields to fight a shadowy foe Fitting, flitting through the mountains in a deeply hostile land, 
already so poor and so ruined by two decades of war that it is virtually bereft of targets. Forget the past, the headline instructs. It's a war unlike any other. So that was 10 years ago. And this next is a kind of a prose poem. Uh, Herat is a, a, a region of Afghanistan. And this is called Capsule History of Herat, Afghanistan. <clears throat> After the Mujahideen had defeated their communist overlords, the men of Herat took to the streets behind their leader, Ismail Khan chanting slogans and firing their rifles into the air. The women of Herat, covered head to toe in burqas, stood in doorways watching the celebration through narrow eye slits. Then the holy warriors of Herat allied with the Taliban to install Islamic rule over the country. For two years, they laid siege to the capital, Kabul. After the last holdout surrendered, the fighting man returned home. They ran through the streets of Herat, shouting in celebration and firing their rifles into the air. Covered head to toe in burqas, the women of Herat stood in doorways, watching through narrow eye slits. Finally, the Americans came. Their troops chased the Taliban fighters back into the mountains and established democratic rule throughout Afghanistan. Now allied with the victors, the holy warriors of Herat once again took to the streets chanting slogans and bring, firing their rifles into the air. Standing in the doorways, covered head to foot, head to toe in burqas, the women of Herat look on through narrow islets. I'm going to read a couple of new poems. Um, I have sort of two. I have a new book coming out next, uh, next spring. And uh, it's a series of kind of journal, journal poems set in the coast of Maine. So I've been sort of writing country poems and city poems lately. Uh, so these are my country poems. Uh, my wife and I uh, vacation uh, in far northern, uh, or far, far down eastern Maine in, in the town of Lubeck, right on the Canadian border. and. Uh, so this is part of a, a recent series. Uh, it sits right on the Passamaquoddy Bay, opening into the Bay of Fundy, the highest tides in the world. And there's great beauty there and great poverty. So this, is, this first poem is called uh, Reveille. But it begins with an epigraph uh, for the whole series here. It's and the epigraph says, uh, there's a question. What do Revlon nail polish and, and Buick automobiles have in common? Pearl essence derived from Lubeck herring scales supply the shine. That's taken from 16 things you didn't know about Lubeck until now. <laughs> Reveille. Sun at two ticks above horizon, air crystalline, with just a hint of heat haze to come, not a breath of wind to stir leaves of trees and bushes, marsh grasses, roadside weeds, garden flowers. Rill of a red-winged blackbird tests the silence. A baying hound follows suit. Fool, its scolding neighbor barks back, that ain't the moon. A pickup truck passes, wiping the slate clean. Start again from scratch. Sun now with three ticks. Crow has something to say about it. Another barking dog finishes the thought. More tires kissing tarmac. Far off, a ten-wheeler testing its brakes. Now a great blue heron parachutes to marsh pool mudflat, folds its wings, strikes a serious pose. Time to get to work.
and this is called Paradise. Rusted tractor, lobster boat up on blocks, tall weeds grown up around them, parked on either side of the garage at the corner of this gravel lane leading to the marsh. The lobster boat badly in need of paint, paint on garage walls weathered too, wood grain and knots showing through, but windows still intact. Stenciled sign on the door reads, car wash, 50 cents. 50 cents crossed out, 25 cents scrawled below. This, the street sign says, is Paradise Lane. One more, IGA. Two men in pickups parked side by side, headlight to taillight in the IGA lot, drawing out their driver's side windows. One smiling asks the other in a heavy down east accent, been in the ditch again lately? And I'll finish with uh, the city poem from the other series called Meanwhile. So I, uh, I take a bus to Harvard Square every morning and then get on the red line to get to UMass where I teach. And uh, I usually stop for a cup of coffee and it's early in the morning and it's often uh, me, and, me and the homeless uh, people in, the, in Harvard Square. <clears throat> Meanwhile. Next bench over from mine in this park just off Harvard Square, a professor in tweeds, newspaper open on his lap, sips coffee from a paper cup. Beneath his seat, an oblong cardboard box shelters someone still asleep. From where I sit, just two boot soles visible. Meanwhile, across the street, in the recessed doorway of a shop soon to open, a young man lies curled on sheets of newspaper, cherubic face in the crook of his elbow. Around him, three tall plastic cups ranged like votive offerings, dregs of stale beer in one, black coffee in another, cigarette stubs in a third. Meanwhile, just blocks away, students in residence halls start their day with only cold cereal for breakfast, or so one news story reports. And at faculty meetings, professors have to forego the cookies traditionally served with their tea. Belt tightening has reached the Ivy League. Meanwhile, the street corner is already bustling. There, an early bird sitting on his overstuffed gym bag has staked his claim. In t-shirt and shorts, bandana wrapping his head, with magic marker and cardboard spread flat on his lap, he's working up a sign to advertise services. Desert Storm Veteran will work for cash. Thank you. Um, I have a couple poems I'm gonna read to you. And um, this first one is called Cherry. The man, when he approached me, or was it me, him, a tall, resident, reticent, smiling, sorry. The man, when he approached me, or was it me, him, was tall, reticent, smiling, a picture of kindness. What you think of as boy next door or taller. What you think of as your brother. That reticence, sweet reticence, like a bowl of cherries left out too long. That fruit fly ridden reticence. That skin that holds cherry semblance long after the meat has corroded. That holds digested fly fodder. I saw his cherry skin, smooth, dark, inviting. And this is called On Finding a Story About Jack. I, I used to write a whole bunch of poems about this Jack and Lily. He is sure he placed 
the small 19th century bas-relief frame he picked last week in the glove box after handing the man a 50. Now there's an, ana now there's an anachronism. Who drives in gloves anymore? How many pairs actually live in cars? With a potential buyer online, he needs to find his treasure. The dealer had had no idea of the value. What do we need? Food, shelter, a small frame that will turn $50 into 2000 Jack looks once more in his car. The March night air sears his skin. His torch runs dim. He fumbles the lock, and then he's, and then he's in. Hold it right there, he hears from the right. Who's right? Who's right? He remembers the gin from, from before. It comes to this, with every new X spores, just add tears, the men Lily loved, mushroom memories. This is my house, Jack thinks, where I grew up, my car, I don't need the man in my face. In Jack's face, sewn in permanent frown, no one needs. The policeman reads his rights. Jack wants his quiet night inside to read more about beaten gold. What is your name, the officer asks. None of yours. Ah, there you are, my precious. Jack turns to the frame. He must, it must have been the gin. He slams the door on the officer's shin when he returns to his car. The blotter reports a knock on the door. A woman opens. Yes, I know him. My husband arrested, it says, assault. Lily tells her sister the story later as she slices mushrooms. Close call, her sister says. Another close call. Thank you. I've got two short poems I'd like to share with you today. The first is called Greener Grass. I want your life. I don't know what that is, by the way. And I'm happy with my life, actually, at least most days and much of the time. But you made a reference to a recent past of life in Montreal and current residence in New Haven, and it sounded alluring. Your black clothes, too, similarly matched by your wives. And although I don't know you or anything about you, I want your life. Maybe just for a day, though. As I said, I like my life. And the second one is called Trees and Storm. Thunder rumbles, lightning flashes, water rushes down the road, the dog cowers at my feet. And trees dance, although I can't feel the wind. Do they dance like the dog because they fear the lightning or in excitement at the rain? Thanks.
I'm Dr. Kathy Phillips. And I'm Dr. Andrew Blum. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease and stroke. It affects more than 3 million people, with 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year. The condition is caused by a temporary disturbance in brain function, resulting in various kinds of seizures. These seizures can produce involuntary movements, changes in awareness, altered behavior, or loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a major chronic medical condition and can affect a person's quality of life similar to arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. It can limit activity and cause pain, anxiety, or depression. It can also be life-threatening. Because epilepsy can also present non-medical challenges such as discrimination and social stigma, we urge you to learn more about this condition. To find out more about this disorder, including its symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment, visit epilepsyfoundation.org. Whether it's infectious disease, severe weather, or a chemical spill, emergencies that threaten our public health can happen at any time. After the events of 9-11, the federal government established the Medical Reserve Corps to respond to emergencies. Today in the Commonwealth, 45 Corps units recruit and train both medical and non-medical volunteers. In addition, the Department of Public Health's MSAR program, or Massachusetts System for Advanced Registration, credentials and deploys healthcare professionals to respond in such emergencies. Now a new effort is underway to enhance emergency response by aligning the activities of both groups. Mass Response is designed to facilitate emergency medical response and promote local partnerships in planning and assistance. And you, health professionals and concerned citizens alike, can be part of this important effort. For more information on Mass Response and how to get involved, visit maresponse.org. Thank mm -hmm. you.